Hi, I'm Rebecca with This Youth Moment. Faith is an important subject. We're going to be talking about it today. In the Bible, in Hebrews 11, 1 and 3, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. We hope your faith will be made stronger by today's message. Today we're going to begin a new series on faith. And what better example of faith is a true hero of faith, Paul, the Apostle, who wrote the book of Colossians. As we begin Colossians today, I want you to think about what is faith? What does it mean to you? Do you have faith in something or someone? Well, here's what Hebrews has to say about faith and the faithful man. Hebrews 10, 23, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now here's Tommy Jones with more on faith. Colossians 1, 1 and 2 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, or Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Since it's so brief, let's look at it once more. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thinking of the whole book of Colossians again for a moment, the key text of the book that well states the thrust of the theme, the preeminence of the prince, seems to be chapter 1, verse 18, which says about Christ, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the head of this body, the church, or the head of the universal church, all believers of all time. He is the beginning. He has existed from the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead, the only one who's been truly permanently raised from the dead thus far. And we want him to have preeminence in all things, in the church, in creation, in our lives, and certainly in our hearts. We want him to have the preeminence. A number of years ago, I heard a statement that has stuck with me, and from time to time, the Spirit has reminded me of. It goes like this. In all Christians, Christ is present. In some Christians, Christ is predominant. But only in a few Christians is Christ preeminent. Think about it. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, He has entered your heart and life. So in all Christians, Christ is present. If we just knew it and believed it and acted upon it as we ought. He is present in every believer. In all Christians, Christ is present. In some Christians, he's predominant. He predominates their thoughts, their desires, their wishes, their feelings, their ambitions, their objectives, their goals, their activities, their words, their deeds. He's predominant. And it's a joy to be around Christians in whom Christ is predominant. But only in a few is Christ preeminent, absolutely first in all things, at all times, in all ways, in all situations, in all circumstances, in all expressions. Only in a few is Christ preeminent. And that, of course, is God's objective. That's his wish. That's his desire that the prince 
the Lord Jesus Christ be preeminent in all things, including our lives. So Colossians will display for us the preeminence of the prince. We'll see in a number of majestic ways that he's over and above, that he's beyond, that he's before, that he's on top of, that he is preeminent. The book of Colossians will display the preeminence of Jesus Christ, but it will also demand the preeminence of Christ in us, in our church, in our homes, in our businesses, in our activities, in our very lives. So we're in for a good journey. We're in for a delightful trip as the preeminence of the prince is displayed and demanded. Well, now but down to the verses at hand. The two opening verses of the book compose the salutation. It's a form that's familiar to those of us who've studied other epistles of the New Testament and any other letters of the New Testament time. It was a very smart, practical form that was used by letter writers of that day. First, they would give the name of the writer, which I've always said was better than having to look two or three pages later to see who wrote the letter. Then they'd give the identity of the readers, the people to whom they were writing, and next, a courteous concern, like I hope this finds you doing well, or I hope your life is moving smoothly, or some nice, sincere expression of courteous concern. We don't write our letters that way today. I suppose the closest we've come to it is the business memo <laughs> that says from, to, and then we leave out the courteous concern and get right to the point. <laughs> from, to, and regarding. But it's the same general good practical approach to a letter or a greeting. Now this salutation is not the ordinary salutation that you'd find in any other letter by people of the New Testament day. It has about it, as you can tell, a very pervasive, deep Christian content. It's written in Christian terms. It's it's a glow with Christian love and sentiment. It, it, it just breathes and exudes Christian thought and Christian intent. And therefore, this salutation, like the others in the epistles of the New Testament, the letters of the New Testament, sets this apart as a unique kind of a letter. Not just an ordinary letter that anybody could post and mail and send to someone else in that day and time, but a very extraordinary letter, a Christian letter, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to the people of God somewhere about a concern that God and the writer had upon their hearts. It's one of those things that sets this book and the other New Testament letters or epistles apart as those writings that were given by God to all of us through all the ages. Oh, yes, it was written to the church at Colossae first. But God had well in mind that you and I would be looking at it this morning, right here, right now. It's for all of us of all time. It's a priceless possession of the ages. So let's look at this salutation. You can tell from the outline in the newsletter, we're going to look at the saluter in verse 1, the saluted, the first part of verse 2, and the salutation itself in the second part of verse 2. The saluter is named Paul. No surprise here. In fact, through the years, in spite of the fact that many liberals have tried to discredit this book or that book or another book of the Bible and have tried, among other things, to discredit our view of the book's authorship, very little objection has ever been raised to the idea of Paul being the human author of the book of Colossians. Without a doubt, you can rest assured that Paul is the human author. By this time, he had completed his three historic missionary journeys. Can you picture them on those maps of the 
times in which he lived, those three long, difficult, harrowing, heroic missionary journeys where he won so many people to Christ and founded so many of these churches. He's been arrested toward the end of his life in Jerusalem, conveyed from there to Caesarea with much hardship and difficulty and threat to his life, and finally transferred to Rome, the imperial city. He had always wanted to reach Rome. He wanted to reach it as a preacher, but he reached it as a prisoner. <laughs> but he reached Rome, and it's from Rome that apparently this book was written. It's one of those that we call the prison epistles of Paul. And as near as we can tell, it was written about 64 A.D., very early, meaning that Jesus hadn't been dead but about 30 years when this book was written. It was the same time, as near as we can tell, as the book of Ephesians, and about four to six years after that majestic book, Romans. So that gives you a little idea of the author and the time. How could he write a book while, while being a prisoner and how could he engage in other Christian activities while being a prisoner? Well, he was under something more like what we would call house arrest. Under guard, unable to go anywhere or leave or flee while awaiting trial. In fact, this is described for us in Acts 28, 30, and 31, which reads, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So Paul, as usual, used every ounce of his energy and every minute of his time as productively as he possibly could. While under house arrest and considered a prisoner, he nevertheless welcomed guests from near and far and talked with them and taught them and, where necessary, preached to them. He engaged in preaching. He engaged in teaching. He engaged in discipling. And he certainly spent a lot of his time writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit letters like the letter of Colossians and other church epistles. So here's this great hero of the faith, busily using his time and energy, even though it was under somewhat adverse circumstances. We need to take a good lesson from that. When our circumstances are less than perfect, there's still many things that can be done for the glory of God, many things that can be done for the helping of others, many ways we can touch people's lives sometimes because of our adversity and through our adversity, other times in spite of it. So the saluter is an apostle. He designates himself an apostle deliberately. I think he does so in order to establish in the minds of the church at Colossae that he is every bit as much an apostle as the 12 original ones, or the 12 that now existed since Judas had been replaced. You know, they had strict rules for being an apostle. It's not an office that's continued through the years. It was an office of those who saw Jesus and spent time with him and learned from him and were eyewitnesses of him. Paul, you'll remember, calls himself an apostle out of due time, because the way he saw Jesus was to be raised up to the heavens for that special glimpse and that special revelation that he received. But he knew in his heart, and he knew with assurance that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. No matter who challenged it, no matter who questioned it, he had no doubt about it, and neither do I. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul spent his entire life serving Jesus Christ. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Who do you want to serve? If the answer is Jesus Christ, you can do that in a very simple and quick and easy manner.
pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to profess our faith in you. Please forgive us of our sins. Come into our heart. Let Jesus take over as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to serve you, Lord, and we want to have faith in you for the rest of our lives. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the kingdom of God. If you've made this decision, we'd like to hear from you. Make sure that you let us know. And now we pray God's blessings upon you as we go throughout this week. And may you continue to know him and to make him known. When Jesus told us to pray, he told us to come to him like a child coming to a parent. It begins like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, 